everything off of your speaker. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, got yeah, it. Go now to make your speaker, microphone, everything off. All off. All off. Mute, right? Yeah, mute. mute. Also your
ですわけ。けど Good morning. Welcome to this、uh, talk by Professor Venki Venkateshan.、Uh, it's a delight for me to introduce、uh, Venki. He's currently the director of the Center for Quantum Research and Technology and professor of physics and ECE at the University of Oklahoma and a scientific affiliate at、uh, NIST Petersburg. He is、uh, also the founding director of the Center for of Optimal Materials. For emerging technologies at Oklahoma. Prior to this, he was director of the Nano Institute at、uh, NUS, that's Singapore.、Um, thank you for various、uh, hats at Bell Labs as well as at Bell Core. As the inventor of the pulsed laser deposition, the PLD process, he has over 800 publications, 34 patents. Let me continue.、Um, so, as the inventor of the PLD process, he has over 800 publications and、uh, 34 patents and is globally among the top 100 physicists in terms of citations. Uh, Venki has graduated over 56 PhDs, 35 postdocs, and many undergraduates on enterprise creation.、Um, he has done well. He is the founder and co founder of three companies and also helped launch two more healthcare companies in, in Singapore. The list of awards and accolades and distinctions is amazingly long. I will、uh, try to、uh, you know, take a few selected ones from that long list.、Uh, so here、uh, we have a few o n e Uh, uh, it, here is a,、uh, He's a fellow of the Royal Society, FRS, National Academy of Inventors, USA, Singapore National Academy of Science, American Physical Society, the World Innovation Foundation, and the Materials Research Society, MRS. Those are the fellowships.、Uh, Professor Venkateshan is a winner of the Bell Core Award of Excellence, George E. Peck Prize, awarded by American Physical Society, and the President's Gold Medal of the Institute of Physics, Singapore. He's on the board of visitors of University of Maryland.、Uh, he's a recipient of the Outstanding Alumnus Award, both from IIT Kanpur and IIT Kharagpur. So it's a delight for me to invite Professor T. Venki Venkateshan to deliver his talk. Yeah. yeah, can you hear me at the back? Okay, good. First of all,、uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And it's a real pleasure for me to、uh, come to TCG Crest. And uh,、um, I'm actually extremely impressed by the kind of the energy and vitality here. You know, very impressive. And uh, uh, it's also a pleasure for me to see my former colleague, Ogle. <laughs> Uh, you know, flourishing here. And、uh, of course, wherever he goes, he m a k e things happen. So it's,、uh, I think you guys have a pretty good future here. I can see that. Okay. So I, but let me、uh, start my talk. And okay. So, this is actually our、uh, Center for Quantum Research at、uh, OU. And、uh, it, it was built only about three years ago, and it was built with a very large private endowment. And uh, it's, um, uh, it's a wonderful laboratory、uh, built to NIST standards、uh, for quantum research. And、uh, I will just say a few words about my own journey and some of the lessons I've learned about life. And careers, you know, in my progress. So I was in the laboratory from 1973 to 1983. That was about a decade. And one of the important t h i n g l e s s o n I learned at Bell Labs was the day I first went to the dining hall for lunch. So on my table was 
Doug Osheroff, the first person who discovered helium-3 and who had a halo around his head, everybody said the guy's going to win a Nobel Prize. You know? and then at the end of the table was Conyers Herring, and to my right was Phil Anderson. And I was just surrounded by people whom I read in solid state physics books and things like that. And all these guys were all like superstars. So I went straight up to my department head right after this meeting and said, you know, I don't know how I'm going to survive in this environment. I mean, if you look, look around me, everybody is so smart and everybody is the people that I used to kind of like think as gods. And these guys are all wandering around here like ordinary human beings. So my department head said, you know, let me show you my list when I joined my Bella. And <laughs> he showed his list. Bardeen, Shockley, Schaefer. It was like his list was even more profound. I said, oh my God, you know. <laughs> like, he said, when you come into an environment like this, right, if you take an attitude that you're going to show that you're a smart guy, you're dead. He said, because there are people around here who are incredibly smart, okay? The real strict was surviving in an environment like this. You basically make companionship, teams with other people, right? Think of a great idea and then sell it to your colleagues and get them to partner with you, right? Now you got the brain power of everybody with you and you can now really solve big problems, okay? That's the way to operate when you're surrounded by smart people. You don't go try to show to them that you're smarter than them. That's a completely wrong approach. You want to work with people and say, hey, I have this wonderful idea. Can we do this together? Can you help me here? So on. And the second exciting point, important point he said is, you know, he said, is angular momentum conserved? I said, yeah, it is a conserved quantity. How would energy mass conserve? Yeah. There's one quantity that's not conserved. You know what that is? And I said, well, I'm not quite sure what it is. I know what you're trying to get at. He said, it's a trick question. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, credit is not conserved. You see, credit is not a conserved quantity. You know, credit you can share in any amount, okay? And that's your passport to success, okay? When you work with someone, someone helps you, you know, then acknowledge the help to others directly in front of them, in front of others, right? If you're in a group meeting, and you are supposed to solve a problem, and someone has actually helped you. And then in the meeting, you say, I solved this problem, but I really couldn't have done it without the help of so-and-so, right? When you say that, right, you're not actually minimizing yourself. You're actually making yourself more magnanimous, and everyone looks at you like, you know, he must be very self-confident because he's willing to give credit to other people. So you actually get benefit in the way people think about you. And at the same time, the guy who helped you, when you acknowledge the fact that, that the person helped you, right, they immediately, next time you go to them with a problem, they will be ready to help you again because they know you're loyal and you are actually willing to acknowledge, right? I mean, I can't mention how, but what it is is that these two principles are so important for me, you know, because I realized that generally intelligent people have fairly large egos. I mean, it's sort of like, Unfortunately, but that's the way life is like, right? But if you can ex execute these two principles, right, it's very easy to break down these barriers and communication. So one of my strongest traits in Bell Labs that I realized was that I could sit at a table with like five people, right, who are all ultra smart, but I'll think of some good idea and get everybody to join me in that idea. You know, that became my real strength, actually. So I launched many programs in Bell Labs, which, you know, most people wouldn't do, but I did those things. You know, I started a lab called IMB Mesotaxi Laboratory, which many, many people started using and became a big, you know, big thing. So I realized that's one of my big strengths, bring people together and make them think. So similarly, when, when I joined Bell Labs in 83, Bell Corps, uh, 83 to 90, that was a very interesting opportunity because the government broke up the Bell system and then they broke up Bell Labs and they created a new Bell Labs for the operating companies that are called Bell Corps. So for me, I said, how, was, how do you create a Bell Lab from scratch? So I was one of the first to volunteer. I want to go there as a manager. So I was one of the first managers in Bellcourt to go there. There were 15 of us, and now we have to build Bell Labs from scratch. And just imagine what an exciting, of course, we have plenty of money, 
But the point is, money is not enough. How do you build the talented pool of people, right? And we created Belcore, and it was just an extraordinary experience. So during that Belcore time, uh, I was also uh, a professor at Rutgers University, where I established a Center for Service Modification, because at the time, the service modification was a very big thing in New Jersey and uh, in, the, in the United States. But the faculty in Rutgers were all fighting with each other. So the different departments were all clashing. So the executive vice president said, Venki, can you help us create a center, bring everyone together? So that's what I did. I created a center for service modification there. Then in Belcourt, what happened is high TC came and uh, we had to figure out everyone, I looked at everyone, everyone struggling to make, you know, quality films of yttrium barium copper oxide. It is a very difficult material to get the right composition. So we invented the PLD process. And I remember at that time, Ogle came and visited our laboratory. And when he came back to India, you started your own PLD lab, right? So anyhow, that uh, the interesting thing that happened was that uh, I had a collaboration with about 60 different groups just planning the entire globe. Literally every country, scientists were collaborating with, with my team at that time. It was an amazing experience. And uh, everybody would come and say, Venki, build us a PLD system. How did you do this? So I said, okay, time to start a company. I started a company called Neosera, which still exists. And uh, that makes PLD systems. And uh, so Belcore wanted, to be, wanted me to be an entrepreneur to stay in the company and uh, be part, run my own company. Uh, but I, what I found was that it was, it was almost impossible to be part of a corporation and have your own company because they, the, the subject matter is way too close and the conflict of interest is just too bad. So after a year and a half of struggling, I decided that I should leave Bell. So I went to University of Maryland, joined the Superconductivity Center, and uh, that was a incredibly ex exciting, you know, 17 years at University of Maryland. And then in 2007, I went to NUS to build a Nano Institute, which is a, you know, very exciting uh, opportunity. And so uh, my original goal to go to uh, Singapore was about six years, but suddenly I looked at the calendar, I had spent 12 years. <laughs> I said, okay, you know, just too exciting. So I said, I because I didn't want to lose touch with the United States. So I wanted to go back to the US. And I went back to the US in 2020. I probably were the guy who brought the COVID to the United States, I think. But it was that COVID, basically. And uh, so, so uh, I was supposed to go to like six different places to, uh, you know, uh, for a job interview. Everything went frozen. And then uh, the opportunities in Oklahoma came where they wanted, University of Oklahoma is going through a resurgence. They want to become a research powerhouse and they're investing a huge amount of money into all kinds of new technology. And they sounded very exciting. And so that's where I am. So in, I've been there for the last two years. And uh, so it's kind of a, a short uh, sketch of my life right now here. So as you can see, you know, I, uh, after getting into uh, Oklahoma, I created a new advanced material center called Comet. So, so this is like, I think building centers and institutes is kind of like my, one of my <laughs> passions, I would say. So the quantum center has a structure like this. We have roughly about 20 faculty members. I recently hired a team of people to increase the quantum engineering contribution. And uh, then, uh, then this is the comet. And this center is now uh, built with Horst Hahn. He, is the, he was a former director of the Nano Institute at Kalsu, uh, Kalsu Institute of Technology. He's now joined us, and he and I are co-directing this uh, comet together. And he just is an amazing person. And uh, he's a uh, member of the European Academy, U.S. Academy, and just a very accomplished person. So, but what I'm even more excited about this center because it involves roughly about ten different departments and a number of faculty, and we're just looking at all oh, there are the novel materials and everything from biomaterials to electronic applications. So this is a very, very exciting uh, thing that's going on. So I'm just gonna skip through a lot of these things. The university itself is what they decided is, they decided to create these verticals. And so the aerospace, defense, global security, environment, energy and sustainability and the future of health. 
and then society and community transformation. And it, it turns out now, I'm becoming more and more aware that whenever we work on new technologies, it actually makes a lot of sense to start thinking about you know, involving people who are involved in society and community transformation because there really is an impact in any time you generate AI ML, for example, right? AI ML potential jobs, but you don't create new opportunities, right? So you need someone who thinks about these issues, right? I mean, what is the impact on a society? How does it affect an average person? So this 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 aspect of the thing is that I'm realizing is a very, very valuable thing. Okay, so I will skip all of these. So we are right now have a, a program in quantum materials, quantum sensing, uh, quantum optical communication, then photovoltaics, and here's where I, I feel that uh, one way or you can really go forward is to build joint program with leading international institutions. So now I have established connection with IIT Madras, Kanpur, Karakpur, Delhi, uh, a, you know, Imperial College and some of those universities in uh, England and then Germany and the work is continuing. So this, is, this will uh, continue to happen. So essentially this is the quantum center on the left, Lynn Hall and the basement of the the physics department, which is the Nielsen Hall, is being completely converted into uh, labs for Comet. Okay, so now I want to talk about AI ML and why I think this is just going to be a life life changer for all of us. Okay, I mean, essentially, um, it's like a freight truck. It's coming. Nobody can stop it, <laughs> and it's going to change our life. I think its impact is going to be far beyond, even beyond the web, for example, invention of the web, right? I mean, I'm clearly say, you know, you will all say invention of the internet certainly had a huge impact on all of us, right? But I think AIML is going to affect us way beyond that. I mean, and uh, so I'll just give you some examples of programs that I'm working on where AIML is becoming an important component. So one of the research that I've been involved in, in the last eight years is called Brathomics. It's essentially all human beings breath, right? We have primary components, oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and so on. But at part per billion level, we produce a lot of organic compounds. In fact, we are like an organic, you, know, <clears throat> you name me name organic compound, uh, is probably in the breath, you know, likely. And we produce about 3000 molecules that we've been physically measured. And these molecules are actually the product of the cellular activity. So, this, so they're product of the cellular metabolism, right? So if something goes wrong with a cell, like a, through a disease, then the molecular output of the cells changes. So can we identify diseases and predict them ahead of time by just measuring the molecular pattern? So that was a challenge that I was thinking about eight years ago. For that, I wanted to build a mass spectrometer where at room temp, you know, atmospheric condition, I can take the breath so I wanted to design a special mass spectrometer that will be very sensitive and all. It so turned out that there's been a giant progress in mass spectrometry in the last couple of decades. And what is the problem with mass spectrometers in terms of sensitivity? After all, we are measuring ions. You take an analyte molecule, you take it, convert it into an ion, and then you measure it, right? So we can actually measure a single ion with no difficulty. So in principle, we should, be have, we should have infinite sensitivity, right? But in reality, when the ionization process is very destructive. So we normally use electron beam to ionize an analyte molecule. So you send an analyte molecule into the mass spectrometer, you shine the electron beams at it. So it's like cracking a peanut with a sledgehammer. Yeah, yeah, you'll break, break it, but you also crush it basically. So these molecules undergo fragmentation. So you don't get a single peak for a molecule, you get multiple peaks, you get a pattern. So that pattern, needs to be deconvolved to get at your molecule and that kills your sensitivity by at least three orders of magnitude, right? So the low energy guys who are doing ion scattering and all these guys, they've been working on this problem of what's called low energy ion ionization, a low impact ionization. They take a free radical and put it next to a big molecule and they attach. And that attachment produces a new ion now, but this ionization process doesn't break the molecule. So this is exactly what's used in these so-called proton transfer reaction mass spectrometers, PTRMS, 
And these are being made like a couple of companies around the world now, and they're unbelievable. Their sensitivity is like part per, sub part per trillion, and they can even do isotopic selection, just amazing machines. So that's the size of the machine. So it's essentially, uh, it's, it's roughly the size of a small Xerox machine. You know, it's on wheels, you can roll it around. So the, there's a little uh, inlet to this thing, and this is the mouthpiece. So what we do is right at this point here, you insert a plastic uh, piece here right at the thing, and you breathe into it. You breathe into, into this machine. So one puff will produce, like this is a breath. You can see so a little peak comes in here. There are two different molecules. One is, I think, isoprene. The other one is acetone. So these molecules, you can see, you get a pulse there corresponding to the breath. So you have this sort of data, right now this machine is accumulating data for about more than 500 molecules like that, okay? So now you have a molecular pattern in this stuff, and then you can go through basically uh, an algorithm to figure out. We also have a set of data from normal people and people who may have a disease, right? And then we compare these molecules basically. Okay, this is where data analytics, the multi multivariate data analysis becomes really important, okay? So I think this is an area where we can really use good people who are very good at this novel statistical mechani you know, mechanism so for extracting information. So here's some data that we did in cancer patients, lung cancer patients. Yes? Okay, now how do I touch something and it went, it's a, how do I? Do that, something like that? Huh? How, do you, how do I make it big? Okay, do I do not, my screen is full. But here it's not. So uh, something got changed here. You know, when I touched it with the thing, it, it actually did that. How about you? No, no, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think this we need to just get rid of that. Huh? Oh, there's there's a top thing. No, no, there's a top cross at the top. Will it? Oh, it shut out the whole thing. Huh? Is that all right? Yeah, it was even bigger than this, huh? huh? Yeah, 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 great. <laughs> Very good. So, <clears throat> is, huh? Yeah, yeah, no, I have no more contact yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So now, this is actually data over five years of lung cancer patients, right? And in Singapore, this is all we could get, 100 people, basically. You know? <laughs> so this data, basically, you can sort of see the lung cancer patients separates out from normal people. And then this is, it turned out that there's a bunch of data that's sitting here, which is separated from here. So we said, why is that separated? And we went, and went back and looked at those patients' data turned out that they actually are TB patients, okay? So they wouldn't fit in with this cancer patient data. So we realized that we can actually identify TB patients too now, you know? So this is a really powerful technique. So, so we actually formed a company called Rathonics, and it so happened in 2020, when, when the pandemic struck, we quickly developed an algorithm for COVID. So essentially, a patient comes in, blows the thing, we, you know, in a, in a replaceable plastic, Tube, which we throw out later. And then that's it, you wait that the, within like 30 seconds, the computer comes and tells you whether you have COVID or not. So the entire test takes 60 seconds, right? So you can actually imagine now, we can actually do 60 second tests for lung cancer, for any other diseases actually. Lung cancer is interesting because many of the patients here that are stage one, okay? Stage one lung cancer is one of the hardest thing to detect because it's completely, these are called principal component analysis. 
And this is because you have multivariate, right? I mean, you have, you know, we have like, you know, so many different molecules that we're looking at. So trying to pr produce a multiple data and there you're making comparisons between, you know, let's say acetone, you know, isoprene and uh, hexanol, you know, all kinds of different molecules you're comparing. How does it compare with the normal patient versus a, with a disease, uh, person with a disease to you represent them in a two dimensional plot? You do this kind of an analysis, you know, principal component analysis. No, no, these are what are called principal components of an analysis. So what you actually did, you've actually orthogonalized, okay, and then eight, you know, eight or ten different molecules, or fifty molecules, and how do you represent them on a two D plot, okay? And that is what's called the uh, this is principal component analysis, right? So this is what I was telling you in the morning that you know, so. Today, you know, my students go, they use these, you know, software, and they're like about like five or six different variants of these things. And they will produce this sort of plot, which gives you clustering of data, basically, you know. And this is an area where I think that a lot of innovations can be done to increase the accuracy of the prediction and so on. So this is a data analytical technique, which I think that could be improved. But what is really about this is that Pattern recognition. You're really recognizing a pattern here. So this is actually a lot of the techniques we use here are AI ML, basically. So you can sort of see how AI ML becomes important in a problem like this. So it just this is the way that sort of it creeps into many other things. I want to check you another technology. This is another company that I've called Neocera Magma. Okay. So what we do in this is we, this is actually and we use a uh, this entire machine is a magnetic microscope. Okay, so what it does is there's a little, you see here, I don't want to touch it, but you can see there's a little cone here. That cone is actually a superconducting quantum interference device, you know, and uh, at the tip of the cone, there's a little diamond window. So this enables you to cool the, cool the uh, superconductor. It needs to be at 77 Kelvin. And then we, this magnetic sensor, and you see this little plate here, uh, that's a sample holder that I can put a chip. So here is a chip. and we scan it under the magnetic microscope, the, under the sensor, okay? Just generates a magnetic pattern. So in this, this is actually a multi-layer, multi-chip module from Intel. And you can sort of see, I'm powering it with the current that goes here and it comes along, comes out that way, okay? Now, this is the magnetic field generated by that current. Now, if I do a Fourier transform of this, I get this. This is the actual current. Now, the beautiful thing about this is, right, this package has actually a plastic covering on it and everything, right? We don't touch anything. You're able to see through the whole thing because the magnetic fields come through, right? So they, so it, everything is transparent to magnetic field. So we can actually look through a package like this and look at plot out a current like this. Now you notice something interesting about the current. It's the same current, but it's kind of fuzzy and weak here. It gets very sharp here. It's a little less sharp and so on. So this is actually Z information. The current is actually flowing from one level, it's in the bottommost level, goes to the next layer that's closer to the sensor, and then moves away to the next layer, next layer, and so on. And this Z information is so critical today because today you have advanced packages is where the whole semiconductor industry is going because Moore's law is dying, basically. You know, you know, there's no more money to be made in shrinking transistor to smaller and smaller size. Okay. People said that what's going to go kill Moore's law is quantum mechanics. We're going to kill Moore's law because the, you know, source and drain is going to get too close, right? But the reality is, it's actually economics that's killing Moore's law. Why? Because every time you went from one semiconductor node to the next node, the cost per transistor would drop, you know. But now, when you go from at seven nanometer node, basically, when you went from fourteen to seven nanometer, the cost per transistor is constant. Okay, you want to go from seven nanometer to five nanometer, the cost per transit is actually going up, right? So the economics is not favoring it, right? And that's why very few companies are now into trying to drive this technology forward. TSMC, Samsung. Intel dropped out, dropped out at seven nanometers, but the uproar was so loud that they got back, in, back again into to protect their reputation, basically. <laughs> but again, Right now, I have a program with the National University of Singapore. They have a 
they have a center for advanced packaging because what is happening in advanced packages are you're taking layers of silicon, you know, one silicon, another silicon, another silicon, right? So you have a stack of silicon wafers. And generally, when a company introduces a brand new circuit in the market, right? Intel uh, announced the next Pentium or something, right? When they introduce it, the actual process yield is only about 20% in the fab because there are always defects in the, in the chips. So when the defects are, uh, they send, send this to uh, what's called a failure analysis laboratory. And there they have instruments like this. So these instruments go, okay, they go and try to locate where the defects are. Shorts, opens, resistive opens, leakages, all these things are located X, Y, Z coordinate. They need that. Once they have that, then they go do surgery, basically using focus fine beams. They can go excavate and figure out what is the root cause? I mean, why do you have this problem, right? And then they give feedback to the foundry, then they fix their processes. So the yield now will come to about 80%. So, you know, so you have to do that really fast because the market is going away, right? So, so this is a very, very rapid process. Now today what's happening is these advanced packages are really thick with many, many ground planes in between. For example, the latest package from, uh, let's say Hynix is roughly about, 20 wafers involved in it, okay? <laughs> Stacked on top of each other, right? So techniques like using laser beam, thermal imaging, you know, or photoacoustic, all these techniques, they, they won't work. So the only two techniques that work are magnetic imaging and X-ray imaging, right? So the National University of Singapore is an advanced packaging center. So they've decided that they're going to work on magnetic imaging. So we are collaborating with them and they're going to use AI ML to take, so you take a pattern like this. The AI ML will look at the pattern and you immediately say where the defect is located, right? So again, AI ML is coming in. So I'm giving you examples of where AI ML is just penetrating all our consciousness from all angles, basically, right? So there's another example. So another interesting example is radar and weather prediction and this is essentially a radar map of, let's say, a cloud system over, you know, right now it's over you know, the Louisiana. You can see Baton Rouge, New Orleans. So this cloud has actually all kinds of information in it generated by radar scattering, basically, you know. And uh, so the, this, the, this, again, you know, requires AI ML to say, which of this region is going to turn into, let's say, a hurricane, or you know, which is going to uh, going to create a nuclear hurricane? Where am I going to get uh, the formation of, uh, let's say, hails, for example, so that you know that kind of stuff, right? So again, it's another example where AI now is becoming very, very important. So I would sort of say, like, it's kind of like AI ML is now like an integral part of what we do. So my advice is. Anyone who pursues anything in research or science must get a background in AI ML. They must be able to use some of the recent algorithms that are using AI ML in their research. It's got to be a compulsory thing, basically. So IIT Kharagpur now, uh, the director was telling me, they are now, almost all the students in IIT Kharagpur apparently now have to learn about at least a compulsory course in AI ML, which is interesting. So I told him that was a great idea, you know. So. This is another area which is very interesting, right? We are now moving into an era where I want to make a film. Someone comes and tells me, I want a film with optical transparency between 500 and 700 nanometers. I want to have the conductivity of such and such a thing, you know? So they give you a prescription. How do I make such a film starting from scratch? So this really requires, again, AI, ML, and so on. So one of the important thing here is to development of, uh, we new, developed a new technology called low angle X-ray scattering to measure the film composition. So any process where I want to make films and you know uh, of a particular property, I need to be able to control the composition of the film as I'm growing it, right? As of today, we don't have a technique to measure the film composition as I'm growing the film. So we have now developed a, a technique called low angle X-ray scattering. This is another company called Neocera. This is the first one that I started in Belcore actually. So what we do here is, we essentially, when you grow films by PLD, for example, we, the, the different targets and the, the so if I, I want to make a material of these three different targets and some combination of them, but now the laser comes, strikes this target, and the material evaporates and deposits on the substrate. 
So now what we do is we have an electron beam that essentially impinges on the surface and comes, uh, and this is something that we use called reflection high energy electron diffraction to measure the film structure and so on and so forth. But these electron beam also generates X-rays, right? And people have been struggling to use this X-rays to measure film composition because they're characteristic X-rays, right? No one figured out how to use it. And that's because of various, you know, uh, scattering phenomena in the film. So in my company, we developed a very novel algorithm to extract composition information from this thing. So as we grow the film, for example, here, the composition comes out to be lanthanum 0.678, calcium 0.32, manganese OX. That's a film that we've made. And that's the in-situ composition measurement. Whereas I send the film now to a company outside who do Rutherford batch scattering, it's considered the kind of like a standard for composition measurement. And this data comes back to us after three weeks. Look at the composition number, 0 0.67, 0 0.32. To within 1%, we are able to hit the composition, you know, accurately using this technique. So this is going to be very important for eventually, you know, you know making controlled fabrication of films, uh, you know, and using feedback to make error correction in the composition as we're growing the film, right? So these are another interesting area. So with that, now that I've told you all about why AI is so important, right? Okay. Another important thing in, in electronics is memories are very important. Okay. So I'm going to go through a small exercise here. Okay. So I'm going to say, okay, the average human brain consumes 20 watts of power. So I said, okay, how much are the human beings consuming in terms of energy and in power, basically, uh, across the globe? So assumptions are 8 billion, okay? And they're working equally hard with their brain, whether they're asleep or awake, okay? That's the assumption. And they all are consuming 20 watt irrespective of their IQ, okay? So that's the other, other thing. And the only correction I've made is I've neglected the brain of our former president in the United States, because you know, according to him, it'll probably throw all these numbers out of whack. So I figured that let's be safe here. So this is the number, 1.6 and 10 to the 11 watts. Okay. Now, if I calculate the power consumed by data center in 2016, it's roughly about, you know, three times that number, okay. The, the 3,000 times that number, okay. Now, if I look at the data center power consumption, then let's say 2025, 20% of the global power will be consumed by data centers in, at the rate at which we are going. And by 2040, there's no power left on earth to our data centers, okay? So it's really important to reduce the energy consumed by electronic circuits, basically. You know, we can't afford to live with the energy consumed by circuits as they are doing today, right? What's the good news? 50% of the power is consumed by memory, you know? And therefore, if you can make efficient memories, which are low energy consumption, then that'd be a very good way to reduce power consumption. So that's one something to remember. The other issue is the von Neumann bottleneck. Okay, why is that important? And it become particularly important becoming when you're trying to solve problems involving, you know, artificial intelligence, basically. So in von Neumann bottleneck, if von Neumann uh, architecture is literally all our computer system today, you know, 99.9% .9 of them, they all have based on what's called von Neumann architecture, where you have a central processing unit, you have a memory, okay, which is separated. So the information basically is constantly being stored in the memory. And then when you want to process it, you bring it to the CPU, process it, then put it back in there again. And then, so this data is going back and forth between CPU and memory. This works actually perfectly okay and efficiently for what I call conventional number crunching and type of computation that we do. But when you get into things like, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, like trying to make decisions and so on and so forth, it doesn't work, work that way because in decision-making, there's a constant inter interflow between the, the, the computation and the data. And therefore, this data transfer becomes an enormous waste of energy and also latency, because it takes some time to move it back and forth. Away. So the von Neumann bottleneck is a major, major problem for the progress of artificial intelligence. In fact, 
Right now, there's been lots of papers which are coming out, like talking about the AIML progress is now getting stunted because the implementation architectures are consuming way too much energy, even in the training process. Okay, for so you know, essentially, this one island bottleneck is a huge problem. So what is the solution? The solution is okay. You know, they're trying to get the memory very close to, so you can take a memory chip and put it right on top of the CPU. But then the amount of heat generated is so much that either of the circuit won't work. Okay, so trying to bring them very close to each other is, is also not a technologically easy problem. So this whole area of newly emerging area is called in-memory computing. That means how can I get the memory very close to my CPU, right? So now the solution could be, ha, huh, instead of having a, a device that only does computation, why can't I have a device that has both the memory and the computation of the same device? So those devices today, one of the candidates are called the memristor. Okay? So the memristor is a device where it's essentially, it's got resistive memory. It can also be used as a kind of like a transistor in a way, right? So that is why memristors have become very important. And a lot of the so-called neuromorphic circuits which are really the way the brain functions, the circuits that kind of emulate the brain, they're called neuromorphic circuits, are all now based on memristors today, basically. So that's kind of an introduction to the main part of my talk, why, why we're doing stuff, okay? So, <clears throat> so well, we are actually, in, in my group, we are actually looking at several approaches. One of them is oxide-based memristors, that's one. Second is we are also looking at live neurons can we use live neurons to make some kind of a circuits which could be interesting and thirdly there's an organic system which i'll tell you about which is very exciting and interesting okay so the oxide memory approaches right now are basically there are roughly as of today four different kind of uh, processes people use one is called auction vacancy diffusion there's also uh, the analog of this where the cations also diffuse in a device. And then you have band gap renormalization. Re this is an idea that we developed in our laboratory. Then this ferroelectric tunnel junction and metal insulated phase transitions. Okay, so all of these different types of processes are used to make membranes today, right? I'll just say a few words about ferroelectric tunnel junction, but I'll also tell you about what is it that people are aiming for, okay? So in ferroelectric tunnel junction, basically, you have um, essentially, you will have a top metal, a ferroelectric like barium titanate and a bottom metal. So there's a lot of other layers in between, just, you know, either for now you ignore it basically. So it's essentially a metal ferroelectric metal. So that, and you're looking at the vertical transport of that and it's a tunneling process, okay? And that gives you a hysteresis loop like this. So essentially as you change the voltage, the resistance exhibits two distinct states that, you know, that. So we started studying this stuff in our laboratory by making this type of device structure where, you know, we take a, a, a simple structure like a platinum, barium titanate, which is ferroelectric, and then the bottom is a niobium dose strontium titanate. Just think of it as a metal, basically. So metal, metal, ferroelectric. Now I can add an extra metal layer in the middle, which is lanthanum strontium manganese oxide. Now you can see all these are done unit cell level, we can control them to one unit cell accuracy, these levels. So for example, this is seven unit cells of ferroelectric, six unit cells of the metal on top. In this case, 20, 20 nanometers, six unit cells, seven unit cells. And you can see this crystal structure. There's a cross section showing that atomically, they're all beautifully single crystal structures, the entire thing, you know, it's really. And so now if I look at, for example, these three classes, you know, three, this is the simplest ferroelectric uh, tunnel junction. It's got one extra layer. It's got two extra layers in it. So then what happens? Right? So when you look at a typical uh, ferroelectric junction, you also get this, you know, you see this is the long resistance. So you see the, there's almost like three orders of magnitude change in the resistive values and the switching. But now when I make a comparison between these three different cases, so this is the simplest case one extra layer, there's two extra layers. What you notice is that the switching voltage is the same in all the three cases, basically. This is a 1.5 volt switching, 
1.8 is the saturation voltage. It doesn't matter how, what are the layers I have in these three devices. It's purely decided by the ferroelectric. So the ferroelectric is the chief that commands, tells you where the switching occurs, okay? So this is a simple thing. What really happens is, if you look at this is the, this is the on state, this is the off state. The off state resistance basically changes dramatically as I introduce extra layers, which gives you the very large on off ratio. The other interesting thing we noticed in these tunnel junctions is that we can actually reduce the number of unit cells of the ferroelectric. So right now in this case, they're down to almost two unit cells of ferroelectric, and still you have this uh, characteristic hysteresis here. So even with two unit cells, we can see ferroelectric behavior. At one time, the theorists believe that for a ferroelectric to know it's a ferroelectric, it needs to have at least three unit cells. But now it clearly shows that no, it doesn't, that's not true at all. It's actually, we are down to two unit cells. And here's an interesting example where a one unit cell ferroelectric still gives you on off you know, ratio in its, uh, in its switching basically. So, so a single unit cell ferroelectric behaves like a ferroelectric, which is, which is an amazing thing for me. You know, I never thought that we'll be able to see this stuff. Also, I'm gonna show you another example where Barium titanate, this is strontium titanate, and barium titanate, the switching here is completely from tunneling effect. In strontium titanate, this switching is from what's called oxygen vacancy formation. So oxygen vacancies form, and these oxygen vacancies are charged. So they can effectively, essentially short circuit a, an electrode. So when you have, so as I'm changing the voltage, oxygen vacancies are forming, and they reach a percolation, and suddenly the device switches. So, so this is purely from oxygen vacancy effect. And you can see the, the voltage dependence and the thickness dependence very clearly. For example, as I change the barrier thickness layer, okay, in the case of barium titanate, which is ferroelectric tunnel junction, the switch on and the saturation voltage are independent of the barrier thickness. They're almost constant. But if you look at the strontium titanate where the switching is coming from oxygen vacancy diffusion, there is this inverse thickness depend. The voltage is basically increasing as, you know, you can see as the thickness basically increases because it's a field driven phenomenon, right? So that tells you the difference. You can also have, you know, both phenomena exist in the single device. So here, for example, is barium titanate, whereas the increase of voltage, this is essentially tunneling induced behavior but here, oxygen vacancy can also start diffusing in barium titanate. So you get now another very interesting memory characteristic from oxygen vacancy diffusion. Question is, all this is really interesting, but what do you really want? What we want is actually, it turns out that in almost all AIML processes, right, the most important mathematical step is actually matrix multiplication, it turns out. Matrix multiplication is fundamental to almost all pattern recognition AIML processes. And uh, so I need to devise a circuit that would essentially enable me to do matrix multiplication easily, right? So that's what a crossbar switch is. So a crossbar switch essentially looks like this. And at the node of each crossbar, you put a memory register, basically. Okay. And so now what happens? Each memory register has different resistance values. So this one has got R1, R2, R3, et cetera. Imagine the, I bring in a vector here. This vector could essentially be, for example, I take an image and then I cut the image into columns and rows. So this column, the intensity in the column could be a vector, for example, right? So then I feed that vector in here in the form of current. So now what happens? If I measure the, the voltage at this point is gonna be the current times this resistance, the current times this resistance plus, 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 it's going to add up all the different things. So the sum of this here is exactly the matrix sum. The way I would do matrix multiplication for a vector is one component, it's just you're going to add them all up, right? And, and exactly. So the crossbar basically does this matrix multiplication for you. That's why it's really important. So what do I need in a matrix, right? So if I'm going to use a matrix to do, for example, pattern recognition, I want to train it to say, identify a cat. So what I'll do is I'll take in, um, some random image and then 
I'll feed it into the matrix. And so what the matrix will do is uh, to train it, what I have to do is I take the output image and I'll say, oh, the output image doesn't look like a cat, okay? So now I'll say in a real cat, for it, this column to be the same as that in the actual cat, I have to adjust these weight of these matrices. This one, this one, these elements have to be changed, right? So in a memristor, I need to be able to adjust its resistance value. Okay, that's a crucial part, right? So let me kind of go to the next point. So how do you do that, right? So this is what I call in a in a uh, this is this is uh, um, you can you can you can call it the positive cycle or the negative cycle. By using pulses, we can actually set the resistance value of a memory to a different values. And I want each of these steps to be identical in step. And the second point is in the negative cycle, I want this to be an exact mirror image of the positive cycle. Okay, that's the real challenge in a memory register people right now facing today. Okay, so about, um, I would sort of say two months ago, uh, University of Southern California and UMass, they, they produced a oxide memristor based chip in which they can do 1064 steps in a, in a memristor device, okay? They're all equal steps. It, it came out in nature as a, a major accomplishment. They've also started a company based on this stuff. My student, Sritosh Goswami, work I'm going to be describing right now, he has now developed a molecule where he's in 16,400 steps of absolutely equal steps. Just blows my mind. I mean, it's like, a, it's essentially 14-bit memory step, which is like the world record today. You know, it's really very exciting. And uh, okay, so the question of how do you, how do you take a memory step and enable to make multiple memory states? So you really got to control the oxygen diffusion in the barrier layer, okay? Right now, what happens is when we, the members, the early members that we were working with, the diffusion in the vertical direction of the barrier is very fast. So the, you, once oxygen vacancy is formed, they're very quickly short, basically. So you fully switch, but you don't want that. What you want is lateral diffusion mechanisms need to be enhanced so that the, the oxygen diffusion occurs very gradually. So from complete open to complete short, you can get multiple states, resistance states. So that's a trick, basically. So that's what everybody's working on right now. Okay, so uh, let me quick through this part. Uh, okay, so now I also want to talk to you about bio approaches to neuronal circuits. There's a lot of interest in, for example, companies in California, they take human neurons, so sensory neuron, and then they've developed ways to take a single neuron and put electrical electrodes from below. And uh, very interesting ideas in terms of how do you make ohmic contact to a neuron? Okay, and it's very interesting. They take a metal, a metal electrode and they cover the metal electrode with an aptamer. This aptamer is just a, a molecule that they put on top of it. And when you put a neuron on top of it, the neuron likes to you know, consume the aptamer. So it essentially engulfs the metal into itself. It's called endocytosis and it covers it. And that turns out to be the best way to make ohmic contact to so you don't really pierce through the, you don't pierce through the neuron basically, right? And so this is really a cool way to do it. So a lot of people are developing all kinds of ideas and they've also figured out how to keep the neuron alive for like, you know, three months, four months. So they want to use these neuron based sensors for bomb detection or all kinds of things, very interesting application. So there's this company called Neurosyntec who is actually making circuits now and so they came to me and said, thank you, really need a way to put the neuron where we want it to go because they grow randomly all over the place. So, yeah. Basically, you know, right now what they do, they, they, is a, they, they actually take a needle and they poke it into a neuron. And this is an incredibly painful process because the neuron is roughly about 20 micron in size and it's inside a vacuum. And you know, uh, I'm in, uh, you're using a, some kind of a telescope, a microscope to look at this thing and you're moving these needles and so on and so forth. You can ask anybody about this stuff, they will all say this is the most painful job I've ever heard, right? But if I want to build a circuit, I want the neuron to make contact automatically and not by human intervention, right? How do I, I need the way to have the neuron 
So the neuron basically is a cell, and most cells, right, if I just put a metal and put a cell on top of it, it won't do anything. The, the metal has to penetrate the, the, the neuronal cell, right? But on the other hand, if I put something that the cell likes on top of the metal, the cell does what's called an endocytosis, where it just engulfs the material, you know, like this, and it reforms its outer, you know, the phospholipid layers reform. So the stuff goes inside the inside the cell, basically. So this metal then gets inside the cell without necessarily piercing it, because the cell itself re rearranges its, its uh, you know, its uh, skin layer, basically. And so this is how they're making homey contact, right? And the, so that's a, I thought it was a very cool idea. But the point is that how do you force the neuron to stay where, where, where you want it to go? So we started looking at actually growth of cells on various oxide surfaces. So we just created essentially deposit oxide layers, amorphous oxide layers, and we grow cells on them. You know, we no, notice that actually cells have strong preferences to what oxide they like to grow on or the oxide they don't want to grow on. I'll give you an example here. This is actually a binary phase diagram where we actually have yttria on the left side, zirconia on the right side. So zirconium oxide is on the right cell, yttrium oxide on the left side. So I'm varying the composition of my substrate, okay, as they go from left to right, okay. You see, neuronal stem cells, right, they hate yttrium oxide. They don't want to grow on yttrium oxide. But the moment I get to about 10% of zirconia, boom, it jumps up and starts growing very nicely on top of this stuff. Human fibroblasts, they require roughly about 50% at that point, then they start growing, okay? And keratinocytes, uh, basically, they kind of like grow very gradually. But in, in all these three cases, yttrium oxide is not a preferred substrate. You can see that, right? So our strategy was, okay, we're going to use you're going to define islands of zirconium oxide, yttria surrounding it. So it actually is the project that you're working on. I left Singapore time, so I've got to catch up back back to this stuff. So this this is the I'll tell you what the problem is. The, the, the one of the very exciting thing is that we took differentiated stem cells, and this is growth on ordinary glass versus growth on the zirconia. You can sort of see there's a 200 percent enhancement in the cell growth, right? So it tells us that actually, if I'm growing cells on surfaces, I can enhance the cell growth. So if you want formed a company called Celibate, the whole idea is to grow cells for application, artificial meat, you know, artificial skin. Right now, a company called Louis Vuitton, they want, want us to grow artificial leather because they make fashion items made of artificial leather and that they can sell and charge an extra pre premium for it because they're not killing any animals, right? So, so this is a big deal. Anyway, um, this is basically the problem with the Neurosyntech, this company. You can sort of see they built this electronic platform for, for contacting cells, but look at the way the neurons are growing. They're all over the place. See, they, they, you have no control on it. So my hope is actually, one of my dreams is actually to be able to create, let's say, a two by two, three by three neuronal circuit, live neuronal circuit. Why? Because if I can create such a circuit, I put an input, I measure an output. I can define a figure of merit for such a circuit, right? Then I can compare a neuron from, let's say, person with dementia or Alzheimer's and say, what is the problem? Is it in the interconnection between the axon and the, and the neuron or is it something else? The soma itself where you have the problem, basically, right? So we can really start studying neurodegenerative diseases much more, you know, accurately, you know, if you know exactly how these cells are really interconnected. Other interesting thing is, if I develop a, a you know, brain medication, I pour it on the circuit, does it improve the performance, for example, right? I mean, does it improve the figure of merit, right? We can really lead to completely novel, what I call, uh, you know, research ideas, if you can learn to grow these cells and make them interconnect. It turns out that if you take a neuron and you actually cut a small channel on a surface, the axon will actually go along the channel automatically. You don't even need to, the cell will orient itself so that the axon can propagate the way. So that gives you a mechanism to interconnect one neuron to another neuron in the directionality of it. You can control that, that using lithography, you know? So this is really cool stuff. Anyhow, it's a it's work in progress. So I want to talk to you now about the quickly our organic system. 
this this work was actually generated by uh, this molecule was in, uh, essentially an invention of Sri Bratha Goswami, who is at the Indian Association of Cultivation of Sciences, but now he's at Indian Institute of Science. And his student, grad, his son, Sri, Sri was my graduate student. So he developed this whole memorist idea. So it's essentially a ruthenium atom with three, eight, three ligands around it, identical ligands. These are basically, each ligand has in it an N double bond N. So you can think of this as like a three-dimensional butterfly, three wings in it, and each wing is an, uh, you can think of it as a, it's a, it's a ligand. And the N double bond N is a key, you know, the key molecular unit that's responsible for its function. So we just pin it on top of a, a bottom electrode of ITO on YSD, and then the brown material is your molecule, and then we put gold electrode on top. So it's a simple capacity structure. We look at that vertical transport of this stuff, right? And when you do that, I mean, you get this uh, remarkable switching characteristic. You know? So there's a J versus voltage, and you can see 321 devices have been looked at, size from one micron to 100 micron. And all these devices are plotted on this curve. So this is the data of 321 devices. And you can see this on off are very cleanly separated, which means that these are very, very highly reproducible system, right? Now, system exhibits a lot of amazing things. The most important thing is that the azo basically, you see, it's got three charge states. One is called state zero, state one, state two. And this corresponds to the, the actual N double bond N versus is just because. So essentially, as I remove the uh, electron, you know, essentially I take an electron out of this, you get this. Then I take another electron, I get this. So these are state zero, one, and two. And they have beautiful Raman uh, spectra exactly corresponding to those states. So now zero, one, and two. So by measuring the Raman spectrum, I can tell what state the molecules are in very accurately, you know? So this is something very unique to this organic system. You know, very few people have such an organic system where they know what the mechanism is. And here we see it. I'll give you an example of what happened. So here's the device characteristic. So at the point where the device is off at one, what, what is the molecular state? You see, the Raman spectrum tells me that the device, there is a zero state, one unit of it, and two units of state one. So that means the molecule is in one, one, zero. Now, if I go to point two, there you see zero state is doubled in size, state one has shrunk, and therefore it's actually in one, zero, zero. Like that, in here, once it's switched, you see everything is under zero, so it's zero, zero, zero. And similarly here, it's one, 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 and here's one, one, two. Now, what you notice, interestingly, think about it is the off states, all these off states, have at least one ligand in the non, you know, one of the ligand in the, in, not in the equivalent site. Whereas in the on state, all the ligands are in the same state. And that tells you exactly what the mechanism of switching is, right? So it's essentially electrons are hopping from the bottom electrode, then hop onto a molecule, then they will hop from this molecule to the next molecule. But then the molecular hopping is determined by the overlap of the LUMO band, okay? So if I have a, non-identical ligand, the hopping will not be allowed because the LUMO band won't ma match. So, so essentially, the probability of hopping in this system per molecule is only two thirds of this guy. But then the hop, total hopping requires say 40 hops, two thirds to the power of 40 becomes a very small number basically. That's why these, these are off state, these are on state, right? So, so you see this really clear thing. There are a lot of interesting things about it. Due to brevity of time, I would quickly skip over this. There's something called a counter ion with this molecule for charge neutrality and other stuff. And this counter ion actually can control the hysteresis of this uh, molecule. Uh, by changing the, making the counter ion heavier, we can make it narrower and so on, okay. But the most interesting thing is the effect of electric field. So when I increase the field in these devices by a couple of ideas. Here, for example, flat electrodes. Device A. When I go to device B, in the bottom electrode, I put some gold nanoparticle. So I enhance the field in the bottom electrode. Okay. Now the third device C is there's not only a gold nanoparticle at the bottom, but also I bring a conducting AFM tip from the top. Okay. So now really fields are enhanced right here. So now you can see device A, switching voltage, four volts, maximum current is about 10 to the two amperes centimeter squared. Now I go to configuration B. The switching voltage dropped down to 
0.4 volts by an order of magnitude, and the current density has gone up by two more orders of magnitude. And finally, when I get the highest field case, you can see the switching voltage dropped to 100 millivolts, and the device is almost a, you know, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 ampere centimeter squared, which is pretty remarkable. In other words, you know, when we actually pattern the electrode, you see, as I go to smaller and smaller electrode size, the switching voltage gets smaller and smaller, which is fantastic because, you know, ultimately I want to build a very small device and everything is going in the right direction for me, right? So, you know, I got very excited at this stuff. For example, this is the dynamics and endurance of the device where you write the state, read it, erase it, write. So you take this and do this again and again and again. How many cycles can we do? And you can see, if I use the flash memory, by 10 to the 6 cycles, your flash memory will start showing errors. This guy is going on and on and on. We've gone to 10 to the 12 cycles, and look at all these states are absolutely stable. You know, No issue at all. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Here, we've taken the device, we heated it to 80 degrees centigrade, and just kept it in the on state and the off state. And you see these states are stable for like three months, basically, happening to them. Really amazingly stable system. So I got very excited. I called the guys in Intel and my said, hey, is there an idea of roadmap for memristors? They said, well, you know, semiconductor companies don't make ITRS roadmap anymore because nobody knows where they're going. So they stopped making ITRS roadmap. The latest one I got is for 2015 for memristors. I think good enough, send it to me. So we started comparing the ITRS projection for, you know, our achieved values and the next big organic device. If you look at these numbers, we are so way off. I mean, in terms of, I mean, we've just, we've gone way past what the ITRS requirements are. Right? And, there, and there are really no organic devices that can match any of these performance. In fact, the one of the exciting devices, one, where now we are down to about 70 millivolts switching energy, switching voltage, and the switching energy is about one attitude, basically. And this assumes the switching time of a five nanosecond, which is the one that we measured, but our measurement is still, you know, limited by our measurement uh, apparatus. It, I think this device will probably switch at about half a nanosecond. And it's probably more like a hundred zeptojoules is probably the switching energy for this device. So this is really, really ultra low energy switching. And it's spatially uniform. I'm going to skip all of this stuff. So the, we have also, you know, done engineering of another, Another molecular system which gives you this multiple memory state. And this device actually has mem capacitance in addition to mem resistance. This is actually, you know, relative permittivity and charge. And you can sort of see this is actually memories in the charge as well as the capacitance. And so this device actually does some very, very interesting things. For example, it behaves like a neuron. You can just take and then apply an external load resistor. So you apply a bunch of input pulse, it will integrate and then it will fire one, at every 135 nanosecond, a, a, a pulse gets fired out. Okay, And you can change the time constant by changing the resistance, right? So this is, this, so that's, this is potentiation. And then the other interesting thing is that by changing the load line, it will actually start producing perfect oscillation, you know, and So it actually produces self-oscillation, and the self-oscillation eventually goes into chaotic regime, which is exactly what a neuron does, actually. Neurons self-oscillate, and they also go into chaos. This is all crucial for the neuron, actually. When neurons start self-oscillating, it's very bad news. Actually, in Parkinson's and other diseases, essentially, neurons get into a state of coherence, and then they start you know, <laughs> self-oscillating, and the person loses control on, on the on the behavior, right? So therefore, the neuronal circuits also have a little bit of a chaos built into them, which sort of interferes with this coherence effects, right? So actually, chaos is an in integral part of our memory system, you know, neural system, which is really interesting. Now, the, 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 the okay. Okay, so this is, a new molecular system, we just published this in Nature, where actually you have multiple memory states in this device. So in a single device, like you take it like a CMOS, right? How many decisions can you make? You make two decisions, zero, one, right? This one device, you can do 73 decisions, basically, in one single device. 
which is really an amazingly remarkable system. And so essentially, we now started comparing some of these. Now, now you know, we're making these things and we're able to now make real circuits out of them. And we compared the performance of these organic things with CMOS-based devices as well as oxide-based memory spheres. And we basically showed that the energy delay product in our circuit, comparable circuit, is almost 4,400 times superior compared to what exists in the technology today. So to me, I will just you know wrap up at this point. This is our team at OU. Um, uh, this is a, and then Indian Institute of Science right now, both Sri Tors and Sri Brata are there now. And University of Texas A&M, Stan Williams and uh, Suin. And then these are my various other collaborators. And I will, these are our, this is our team and publications and I'll, I'll stop. Thanks. Thank you. Remarkable, Remarkable individual uh, you often don't meet uh, that much and his enthusiasm at his age, which I will not tell you because yeah. he, he, when you look at it, it will not be able to say what his age is. And I've been seeing him for the last 40 years in the same uh, mode of enthusiasm and diversity. I often wonder if he were to focus only on one field and work on one thing, what he would have achieved. But that is not a Venki. Many people ask me also why you do different things, but that we are born that way. You know, some people, you know, they do Raman effect in PhD and they retire as Raman effect specialist and so on. Sometimes they do good work and very deep work, but you know, you have to be born that way to be able to do that. For us, we try to see different things, get enthusiasm, try to learn new things. So that is the personality issue that some of us has. And the important thing about his entire work, as you will see, is that wherever he has put his uh, sort of head on uh, to try to solve a problem, he collects the right kind of people and then goes deep into that, into the level of understanding and so on. So it is not something you do different things, but do something and run away with something else. And it takes to the level where the technology development and translational research goes to even a company and you are selling that as a product. Okay, so which is something very, very unique. And uh, congratulations for the entire career that I have been witnessing as a friend. Now some questions, uh, time for some questions. Yes, sir. Yeah. Last molecule that you showed, which is a, a yeah, yeah. molecule. I was wondering that how can that act as a kind of a DNA, such a stable set of oscillations, uh, because uh, this would have their intrinsic vibration of force, hybrid modes, but that is not reflected in the. In the yeah, it's not. Typically, the energy scale for a lot of these processes is about 100 milli electron volt. Okay? okay. So, this is still, you know, a little bit higher than those energy levels to interfere so far, you know. So surprisingly, these are incredibly stable systems. You know, I would have never bet on it. I mean, there's certain things I, even today I asked Sri Bratha, I don't understand these things, Sri Bratha, how you explain this to me. We take this organic molecule, take the device, we put it inside a vacuum system, heat it to 500 centigrade, and we bring it back to room temperature. The, the characteristic exactly overlap. I say, you know, this is, you know, many inorganic material, non-organic stuff will decompose at 500. How come this stuff is so stable? Yeah, I still haven't got a satisfactory answer from Sri Bratha on this one, but it's a, it's truly a remarkable system. Yeah. Really. The, the factual material that you said answers my second question. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. I have actually quite a few questions on different parts of your lectures. Yeah, sure. But I'll catch up uh, later on. But let me ask you quickly. Okay. Of so mass spectro spectrometry that you defined at the beginning. Yeah. You said the pot proton attachment to the molecule, right? No, actually, it's not. It's called proton transfer reaction mass spectrometry. But in reality, the you can have a whole range of radi free radicals. Okay. It could be, you know, OH minus, it could be, you know, uh, or it could be a, a positive radical of various combinations. So let's, so, let's, take so one of, can actually, huh? let's take just one of them. Say yeah, sure, sure, yeah. 
but the attachment probability is going to be different for, with for different molecules right different organic molecules yeah organic molecules yeah, yeah. So, so how do you so, how do you control the relative ratio of detection yeah so that is there's a very interesting point actually so what happens is that the using whatever you try to use a radical that you think is best fit for the molecules of interest that you're looking at right so typically when i take a, let's say a cancer patient and i look at their molecular spectrum so you get these 500 molecules, their intensity, okay. Then I take a normal person, an average normal person, and then we take different spectrum, okay. So you get you know, what's called a heat map, okay. In the heat map, what, is, what it shows is which molecules are showing the largest differential, either positive or negative, right? Mm -hmm. So then what you can, you can do is you can go pick, let's say, a set of, say, 10 molecules of the plot, right? And when you make the selection of these molecules, then you can take into account which of these molecules were like the same free radical, right? Mm -hmm. Then, so this requires a kind of a designing of your experiment so that so that you don't have to do excessive renormalization for all of them. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. Just a quick explanation that you said that membrister resistance yeah. goes up in steps yeah. versus pulse. What pulses are those? I mean, I didn't get it. Okay, so the the idea there is it's actually in these memristors, uh, and you, what you do is you have to what's called a setting of the memristor, the state of the memristor. So for that, you normally use a bunch of pulses, uh, and uh, that pulses, the voltage pulses, and these voltage pulses would essentially push the, you know, will create a, a profile of uh, vacancies that will give you a specific resistance for that device. And now you put it inside your, uh, you know, now the device will, at that particular cross point in your cross bar switch, will have, give you the right weight for a matrix filling. Okay, for my other questions, I will touch you a little bit. Sure, sure. Yes. Yes. So uh, you said this, uh, Neurons are attached to this oxide materials. So, uh, what is the role of ferroelectricity in that? What is the role of ferroelectricity? I mean, uh, when uh, you. You mean a neuron thing? Neutrons. Are you talking about the live neurons? Yeah. Like live neurons? Yes. So, the, the, those experiments have nothing to do with ferroelectricity. They're just plain oxide films on surfaces, and we just grow. So what we do is we take a material library, a four inch way for a material library. So they'll have different materials at different points, right? We take a PDMS layer and we pattern small circular reservoirs all through the wafer. So under each reservoir is a different composition, right? Then we grow cells in all of them, okay? And then we go and look and say, where do the cells flourish the most? Where do they show the least, et cetera? And now you've got a correlation study with the composition and the Right. So those oxides are not necessarily always ferroelectric? So no, no, right? The, essentially, we did a lot of studies to try to figure out what is the cause of this, this effect. For example, yttrium and zirconium are right next to each other on the periodic table, okay? like they're neighbors. Why is it that they behave so differently, right? In fact, you know, my vice president, I told him, look, we see these effects, you know, we really need funds for this stuff. Can you internally fund it? Because I don't know how to write a proposal to the life science community that they'll be accepting it. So he said, send me one page description of what you're doing. I will then, you know, I'll do my own review. So I said, okay, send him this description of all of this stuff. We knew it works. Okay. He sends it to three leading biologists around the world, Karolinska Institute, Rockefeller Institute, and some other place. Okay. And all three came back and they said, don't let physicists do biology experiments. <laughs> they said, they said, they said, these guys have no clue what they're talking about. You have water, which is a polarizing medium. We just going to completely neutralize the ability of the uh, molecules to recognize what the surface chemistry is and all the sort of, all three of them, you know, completely. So I, I, I told my vice president, you see my data here. I mean, I, I am growing, this is the real data. I mean, you know, why is it not accepting? He said, look, they have all this prejudice. So he, so he actually funded me. Vice President believed me and funded me. And we got all this data. So it turns out it has to do with addition. So certain, all these molecules that I showed you, not all, all cells are like that, okay? These cells like to grow under an addition state. So you put the cell, they 
stretch out on the surface actually, and they're very happy. If I put a cell on yttrium oxide, the cell like curls up into a little ball, it's really frowning and angry looking, you know, <laughs> it's really interesting. So the, the more they can nicely stretch out, the more they're ready to reproduce very happily. Okay, that, that, that's very important. So we actually developed a mathematical formula for all of this stuff. You know, the, the three parameters fit, we can actually describe a cell and a particular interface. Very interestingly, yeah. Hello, sir. Yeah. Very nice talk. So what is the reason behind that, that molecule which I've shown in this? Uh, why is it so, so stable after heating also? Which molecule are you talking about? Uh, last molecule. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, why is it stable? Huh. Well, I mean, the uh, stable means, I mean, the well, why should it not be stable? Yeah. Are you in the 500 degree centigrade experiment? Yeah, yeah, that, you know, I, I, I myself am a flabbergasted by that experiment, I'll be honest with you, you know. So, you know, when we tell this in a conference and we say this, most chemists don't believe us. They come back and say, that's a lie, they say. You know. So what can I say? No, 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 we just, uh, you, you know, we just, uh, we, we, no, it's a device, right? We take the device, put it in there, heat it, and then bring it back down. No, no, yeah. No, but just the stability of the molecule, and it, yeah. Thank you. It was a great talk. So okay. I just wanted, I have several questions, but I'll ask only one. Okay. That is regarding this FTJs, the, the periodic yeah. yeah. I'm just wondering how sensitive how? Uh, it is, how sensitive is the role of the quality of the interface reflected on the ruggedness of your switching behavior? Because you said that there is an oxygen diffusion. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, uh, so the, the question I, I is. I agree with you. Ferroelectric yeah. tunnel, I mean, these are all actually atomically flat, right? Because the PLD grown atomic with the, M, they're like MBE. So these are like unit cell flatness, right? So the, that means that. You can achieve a, a similar kind of a thing like as an MBE here? Absolutely. Almost. Absolutely. You showed the high yeah, resolution yeah, image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are all um, uh, atomically flat. I can show you more. <clears throat> TN. I assure you, yeah, this this cross section is was not very, yeah, yeah, it was not was not that clear. But we have some now atomic resolution, you know, like uh, aberration corrected uh, microscope Microsoft. images, absolutely spectacular. I mean, these interfaces are really, really, you know, atomically flat, so yeah. really it's nice. More but the bottom line is that <clears throat> these these ferroelectric tunnel junction, they're not that so stable. Last, last question because, because everybody's hungry. The oxygen diffuses basically because of oxygen diffusion, so they deteriorate with time. That's why this molecular system is so amazing. Yeah. Uh, I have one question. Yeah. Uh, so when you mentioned about this magnetic imaging, uh, what is the sensitivity that you were looking at? Ah, uh, okay. They're typically looking at like uh, uh, the Pico Tesla type of magnetic field. I see. Yeah. Okay. Another question. You mentioned about low angle X-ray scattering during right. your uh, growth process. Yeah. Now, how different it is from a small angle X-ray scattering where you yeah. Uh, in small angle X-ray scattering, you're only doing X-ray to X-ray, right? right. Just doing, so that not, you essentially have a detector that measures the X-rays. Here, we actually, the, uh, the electron beam generates characteristic X-rays of different, different elements. So we're oh, looking okay. at the characteristic X-ray of different elements, right? So we know what they are. And okay. so that's how we make the measure. Yeah, okay. I think that's all. Thank you very sure. much. Sure. Uh, we thank this wonderful talk and the Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>